Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming here today and, um, and for not watching the World Cup, although I was saying to Jack earlier, if anything like me, I'd go to a lecture on plumbing supplies to not watch the World Cup. Um, my name is Duncan Exley. I'm the director of the Equality Trust. The reason we exist is because the UK has one of the highest rates of income inequality outside of the developing world. Uh, one of the biggest gaps between the richest and the rest. Um, one of the things that Kate has been very big on demonstrating to us is that when inequality reaches the sorts of levels that we have now, it damages society. It damages the health of all of us, not just the poorest. Um, it also damages the economy by suppressing average incomes and by inflating costs. And it also damages democracy because rich people can buy influence. The Equality Trust exists to develop and promote solutions to excessive inequality. So we act as an independent information source on the drivers and the impacts of inequality. Uh, as you will see if you care to follow us on Twitter. Shameless plug. Um, we have a number of local groups that are affiliated to us, of which one, Equal Edinburgh, has people at the back there somewhere. John, can you give us a... the front. Uh, uh, the front, yeah. <laughs> and he has a mailing list at the back. I do encourage you to sign it if you are in Edinburgh. Um, one of the things we do is to ask people who are promoting big ideas to justify themselves, to explain how their big idea will reduce inequality. And we think Scottish independence is quite a big idea. So over the last few weeks, people from both sides have been keen to talk about inequality. So we're bringing people together from both sides to challenge each other about particularly that point. Will your solution make Scotland a more equal place? We are very privileged to have them here. We're also privileged to have as our chair Professor Kate Pickett, who is a co-author of The Spirit Level, a book which really kick-started a huge debate about inequality. It's one of the most influential political books of the last decade, and is quoted by politicians across the income spectrum. I will t I'm told that she's happy to sign copies of The Spirit Level, which we have at the back after the event. <coughs> Um, that's enough for me. I will hand over to the aforementioned Kate. Thank you very much, Duncan. For those of you who are hanging out at the back, there are seats at the front. Don't be like students. <laughs> <laughs> Come right up. As Duncan mentioned, income inequality has profoundly negative effects on health, well-being, social cohesion, you know, all, all sorts of ways in which um, our well-being matters. I, mean, I have spent time on the train today actually doing some statistical analysis, which is what really you know, gets me going. I mean, this is, this is what I enjoy doing. I like nothing more than getting my hands dirty in the data. And um, I was looking at how changes in income inequality over the past decade are related to changes in child well-being in rich countries over the same decade. <coughs> Nobody's ever been able to look at this before because we've only had two international reports on child well-being about a decade apart. Countries that got more unequal over the last decade have seen significantly larger declines in child well-being. This is really important. The data keep on telling us that our intuitions are right. You know, when we wrote the Spirit Level in two, well, no, we didn't write it in 2009, but we published it in 2009, we wrote it in about 2007, so it's a long time ago now. But since then, the evidence has continued to accumulate from all sorts of disciplines. Duncan mentioned how economists are now looking at how income inequality affects economic stability. 
environmentalists are looking at how income inequality affects our ability to cope with the challenges of climate change. And we're getting more and more and more evidence of the psychosocial impact of income inequality on our health and well-being. So it really matters whether societies become more equal or deteriorate in their levels of income inequality. And when a country decides to maybe do something as profound as change its constitution, change who it looks to, change the way it <coughs> operates. When we, when we see something like the possibility of Scottish independence, we know that that's going to have profound impact on levels of income inequality. <coughs> and we need to think about what that means. And I'm really excited to be here tonight sharing this debate between those who are in favour of Scottish independence and those who are not, and asking the question of whether or not independence will lead to Scotland being a more or less equal place. So I'm delighted to introduce our two speakers tonight. Jackie Bailey has represented Dumbarton constituency since 1999 when the Scottish Parliament was first created. And before that, she worked in the public and voluntary sector most recently as a community economic development manager for a local authority. And in the past, she served as deputy minister for communities and then was promoted to social justice minister from 2000 until 2001. And after the May 2007 Scottish Parliament elections, she came back to Labour's front benches <coughs> as a shadow man minister for parliamentary business. In 2008, she was appointed to a newly created position as Labour's Chief of Staff in the Scottish Parliament, and she's now Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Health, Wellbeing and City Strategy. So, I'm are you not. shaking your head? Because I'm not. It's <laughs> okay. Ohio. Whatever, it sounds good. <laughs> 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 And now it says you are currently serving as Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Equality and Welfare. Is that well correct? Well done, yes. All right, what have we got there in the end? <laughs> Jackie will be speaking um, for the no. Robin McAlpine is Director of the Jimmy Reid Foundation, which aims to counterbalance, and this is in quotes, the well-funded conservative and neoliberal agendas being pushed in Scotland by big business, business-funded think tanks and advocacy groups, and by sections of the corporate media. It aims to raise the public and political profile of alternatives to the profit-driven ideologies which have dominated, and presses for better understanding of cultural, intellectual, and social issues which are often overlooked in political debate. And as well as that, Robin is editor of the Scottish Left Review, and author of No Idea, Control, Liberation, and the Social Imagination, published in 2005. Your last book is even longer ago than my last book. Well, I've got, I've got another book since that one happened. I've got two books since then. Okay. That's a nice book. Puts me to shame. <laughs> and Robin is obviously here um, to speak on behalf of the Yes campaign for greater independence. What we're going to do tonight is, Jackie's going to start, she's going to speak for around five minutes, but I told her I'm not going to be too strict, because she basically said, don't be strict. <laughs> um, Robin will respond for about five minutes, then Jackie will come back for about three minutes after that, and then Robin will have a chance to come back after that, and then we'll open up the floor to questions and answers, and I hope we'll have a very lively and um, informative debate. Chris, oh, thanks very much, Jackie. Thank, thank you very much. Um, can I thank you all for the invitation to attend the meeting? Because um, I think every opportunity <coughs> to debate, particularly during the World Cup, is to be seized with both hands. Um, I mean, after all, I, I, you know, I do know that the debate here in Scotland, it will be passionate, it will be full of vigour, um, it, it will undoubtedly make us fight and debate and argue with each other. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Because whatever I think of the outcome of this, the fact that we've had this conversation, talked about the things that matter to us, is critically important. And in that battle of ideas, I so hope it doesn't become 
a competition between Braveheart nationalism or Union Jack unionism because that would do a disservice to us all. I want it to be about the country we live in, the country we bring our families up in, and the country we work in. And the choice before us is huge, it is irreversible, so we do need to debate and explore our different ideas to make sure we get this right, because it's not just about my generation or even my daughter's generation, it's about her children and the future of our country. Now I'm very proud of Scotland, I'm proud of, of the achievements of people in Scotland, but I am equally pragmatic. Um, I think with my head as well as my heart, and I like to balance all the different arguments. And whilst I do have hope, that hope is tempered by experience, because I am, after all, a Partick Thistle supporter. And that's the only confession I will make this evening. But, but it's not just about you know, knowing where you want to be, it's about testing whether anybody is actually practically offering you the way forward. Now, I do want the best of both worlds. I make no apology for that. I want a strong Scottish Parliament, um, a Scottish Parliament that has responsibility not just over health and education and transport and all those things, but actually there is a promise and a guarantee of more powers, and I think that's right. After 15 years of devolution, we were always going to move forward. But I do want to be part of that family of nations that is the United Kingdom because I believe we draw both strength and stability from that relationship. Now away from the heat of the debate, I think there is much we would agree on about the kind of Scotland we want to live in. A Scotland that is characterised by opportunity, a Scotland where inequality is not just reduced but driven out, um, a Scotland where everybody in, with every single talent can flourish. But where we disagree is just how we get there. The values that brought me into politics, and they remain my values today, are about fairness, about social justice, about equality and solidarity. So this debate for me can never be about borders and flags. It is fundamentally about class and community. Working people in Glasgow will have more in common than working people, you know, more in common with working people in Newcastle, in Liverpool, in Manchester, in Birmingham, than we do with a Highland-led, or dare I say it, an Edinburgh banker. My politics is defined by addressing need, not defined by geography, by where somebody lives. And I don't just want to improve the lot of people in Scotland, or indeed the United Kingdom. I think we should be much more ambitious than that. In the week where last year 1,500 people died in the Rana Plaza disaster, making mango, Primark, and Gap clothing, I think our ambition about tackling inequality needs to be much wider. It's a global problem. It requires a global solution. And I think tackling that by countries joining together is certainly my goal. But equally, looking at the other end of things, is not for me about shifting power from one parliament and one set of politicians to another parliament and another set of politicians. Because Fundamentally, it is about shifting power back to communities, but also shifting power from those who own the wealth to those who actually created it. That's the real division for me. It's not about Scotland versus England or the rest of the United Kingdom. It's a division between working people and the wealthy. And I believe fundamentally in progressive politics, politics that are about attacking need, about tackling inequality, about creating opportunities. And when I think back to some of our collective achievements, I think back to the women's suffrage movement, I think back to the creation of the NHS, I think back to securing workers' rights across the country. None of that was achieved by changing a constitution. That was achieved by struggle, by campaigning, by marching, for fighting in what we believe is right. That was achieved by political will. We have worked together, we've pooled and shared our resources across 60 million people rather than 5 million. And when I think back to some of the things we have done collectively, I am proud of those achievements. But to be frank, you know, halving child poverty is not enough. You're absolutely right about the link between child poverty and then further inequality. Children by the age of three have their life chances mapped out and there is a very long shadow of inequality before them if we don't get it right then. 
But I am equally concerned that that isn't a choice between a UK government, which frankly at the moment I have very little sympathy with, or a Scottish government um, that, that claims it doesn't have the power to do things. It isn't a choice between two governments. It's fundamentally about challenging both of them to tackle inequality. You do that by addressing need, not nationality. I would argue for a no vote on the 18th of September because I don't think changing the constitution delivers on tackling inequality in the way that I want to see. But let me just say this. The debate has become incredibly heated, um, sometimes overheated. On the 19th of September, whatever the vote is, Many of these people in this room, on different sides of the argument, have to pick ourselves up and work together. We need to do that, whether we've campaigned for a yes or a no vote, because actually what we believe in is bigger than constitutional politics. So I look forward to seeing many of you, whichever the side of the debate you're on, on the 19th of September, because that's when the hard work starts. Thank you. Oh, you're spot on in five minutes. What a challenge, Robin. Well, all I can say is do be strict to me because you need to stop me. <laughs> <laughs> There's, it's a big question for five minutes. Let me see if I can you three things in five minutes. One, Britain could be a great vehicle for redistributing wealth, for sharing risk and for sharing reward. It absolutely isn't. It's the, simply the worst place in Western Europe for doing this. So whenever you hear somebody say, yeah, but Britain could be good at this, yes, it was for 25 years, but that ended 45 years ago. Mm -hmm. Everything since then has been going in the other direction. We have to look at evidence. Um, and the evidence says that Britain is now at the bottom 20% of people in Britain, they're the poorest in Western Europe. Uh, second lowest wage economy in the developed world. I can do this for quite a long time. Every statistic will tell you the same thing. Britain is the worst country in Europe for redistributing certainly in Western Europe, probably for all of Europe, and it's probably the fourth worst in the developed world. This is the reality. That's thing one. Britain is no good for equality. Thing two, there's a reason. Every political party in Britain follows one political philosophy, and it's a philosophy of conflict. It lies at the heart of the politics of Westminster. The philosophy of conflict, conflict works on the basis that if you put two people in a room, whoever comes out alive must be the best. It's a sort of inverse Darwinism, it's a sort of misreading of Darwinism. It says that go, if we keep creating artificial contest, and then we keep backing whoever wins the contest, over time we will have naturally selected the best people to run society. It doesn't, it just naturally selects bullies and psychos. That's what that kind of conflict politics does. It creates um, massive cartels, it creates monopoly, it, it hoards power, and it starts to believe that these politics are always the politics that we have. We know best, we know best. Now that conflict politics covers everything. So if you can buy up all the land and control house prices and push the prices of house up, which strips wealth from young families and puts it in your pocket, that must be good for everybody. If you can build a supermarket and a field outside of a town, close its um, high street, remove all of its local economic activity and export that immediately to your equity owners, that must be good because that's conflict. If you're a child, you put two of them in a room at the age of 16 and you say a test that you believe is the correct test to measure this kid's worth for the rest of their life, if they pass the test, they will go on to wealth and if they fail the test, they won't. It's a conflict model. It happens in everything. That is why, fundamentally, Britain is unequal. Because if you allow cartel and the biggest to dominate, that's what happens. You get domination. And it's a complete misreading of uh, Darwin anyway. I don't know if anyone saw the fabulous um, Horizon documentary about what cats do when you're not watching them. I have a cat. We've got a cat there. Fabulous creatures. And the very interesting thing about cats is, you know, that arching of backs and clawing of claws and spitting and that's them fighting, right? No, it's absolute garbage. Cats are far, far too effective predators. If two cat fat cats fight, they will probably both die. They are far, far too dangerous. The arching of the back and the hissing and the spitting is a naturally developed mechanism to prevent fights. That's what it's about. Because Darwin didn't say, um, Darwin didn't say this is about survival of the biggest. He said it's the survival of the fittest, the most effective. And the simple reality is that throughout all aspects of our history, whether it's economic history, social history, or indeed biology, what works best, what creates the best outcomes from all is cooperation, not conflict. So let's assume that we're never going to get a change in those politics from Westminster because nobody is offering it. What will we do? Now this is where there's 
and what I'm presuming is maybe about three minutes left. There's no way that I can even cover this. We've been working a project. Well, the first thing I want to say is that I'm not SNP, and there's things in the white paper which I do not agree with. They're wrong in energy, they're wrong, badly wrong in corporation tax, and they're wrong on, um, on, the, re on the regulation of banking. Um, three areas where I think we've got it very wrong. Nevertheless, if you were to put that white paper in place, yes, Scotland would be a more equal place. It contains some of the things that you need to do, just not all of them. So let me give you a quick whip through the kind of things that you would do if you want to end inequality. Um, I would argue, number one, don't be in Britain. That, that's the first thing I would do. <laughs> but the, the, but, but the, the actual actions you would take, and I should say, for anyone that doesn't know, the Jimmy Reid Foundation is not allied, allied to any political party. We're not, I'm, I'm believing in independence, but we're keeping space for people from any side that wants to contribute. We ran, began a project called the Commonweal Project, which says we have this opportunity, this period to think about Scotland again afresh. What would it be if you could make it? We just invited people to contribute, and we get knocked down in the interest. We've got now 50, over 50 major academic policy papers, which are following all of this, this work. And can I just say that there is no reference in those 50 papers that's more regular than um, the spirit level. It's you know, just a little bit awestruck to be here after the amount of times that I've referenced that, um, I've referenced that document. What do you do to change things? One, participatory democracy. You've got to take decision-making power out of the hands of the elite. Because the elite always think that they are there for a reason, and therefore if they're extremely rich and everyone else is poor, that must be justice. What you have to do is start giving power to the people who are not rich, and then they'll start to see it in different ways, and they'll change political priorities. Um, I, should, I should have, of course, said, we've written all this up as a book. Nobody can read 50 policy papers. So we've got a book, plain, plain language, no graphs, no charts, no jargon. Um, no bullet points, no italics, just a straightforward 140 pages. Here's how you transform Scotland to make it more equal. Um, I would have brought you copies tonight, but um, I, I just have to give them all away. Um, so you can get it on our website, allofusfirst.org. So one, um, you've got to get participatory democracy in, in place. Two, you need economic reform. We have an economy that's predicated on wealth extraction, not wealth creation. We don't make, we don't do. What we do is we capture existing markets, so property, we, we, you know, we, it's not that we've got more housing supply per person than we did before, it's just more controlled by a smaller group. We don't have more food than we did before, it's just controlled by a smaller group. We don't have more of us in the banking, um, with bank accounts, it's just controlled by a smaller group. That's got to reverse. We've got to move away from that. The only way to do it is an active industrial policy. We have to sit down and say, the economy is not outside of democracy. The economy is part of our society. We live in a democratic society. If we want to move to a high-wage economy, we all have a democratic right to do that. Another key way that we've got to do that is industrial democracy. Britain is the 27th out of 28 European countries for industrial democracy. The only country that's worth is, worse is Lithuania. If you take these, this group and you put it in the top, and you divide it in two, everybody who is in the top half for industrial democracy is also in the top half for social and economic outcomes. Everyone who's in the bottom half for industrial democracy is in the bottom half for social and economic outcomes. This is because Industrial democracy enables ordinary people to negotiate a larger share of wealth for themselves, for, for, for their social class, for their group, and that is one of the crucial things that drives down inequality. I could talk about childcare or public service, the importance of public service, not just as the delivering of service, but as the incredibly effective way of redistributing wealth. Um, because this is the other thing, uh, is that we've got to remember what redistribution means. It doesn't mean allow a failing economy and use tax credits to make it seem not so bad. That's not redistribution. That's just charity <coughs> in the back of a failed economy. You have to change the economy. Um, every cash transfer is a sign of a failure, of a failure of equality, not a success in equality. So we have to put that fundamentally into our economic transformation. There is so much more that I could talk about this. It's really important that we get this message. I'm getting the tap. That's what I say. Um, there's so much more I could talk about. And what I want to see in this, as I've said in a whole bunch of different contexts, about commonweal, this idea of commonweal wealth sharing, common for the well-being of all. And um, one of the crucial things that we get across with inequality and with everything else is the Westminster obsession with magic button politics. If we press this magic button, it'll solve everything. If only we deregulate, if only we cut tax. If only we cut public services, it will fix everything. This is a complete myth. It's a complete nonsense. The only thing that matters <coughs> is everything we do. Everything that we do as a government, as a society, and as a local government, everything that we do affects inequality in one direction or another. We need to systematically go through our politics and say we need to change it from one to the other. We need to move to a politics of greater equality. Nobody at Westminster is offering any of the things that need to be done to change this. The white paper's offering some, 
common wheel offers much more. There is a democratic mandate in this country to make it happen. A yes vote will give us the opportunity and you will be amazed how quickly we can begin to turn things around if anybody in politics actually gave a monkeys about reducing inequality. Thanks. <laughs>
on the 19th of September in, say, Sweden. You know, it just doesn't happen that way. It takes political will to achieve this. It takes a laser-like focus on need, not on nationality. Um, and it takes us to actually work incredibly hard to achieve greater equality, not just in Scotland, but across the United Kingdom. That's the big prize, not just simply doing it in Scotland, but anywhere where there is a child living in poverty or a fa family suffering from inequality. That should be our ambition, not simply within a defined border. One of the great things about this campaign is the public meeting. I'd never done a public speech before this campaign started, never spoke to an audience, but I've done meetings, but never spoke to an audience before. In March, I did 18 public meetings in four weeks, which is exhausting. Every night of the week at these things. And it's the same question. It's the same question at the heart of this. We don't, most participants in this debate don't really agree about the kind of Scotland, disagree about the kind of Scotland that we're wanting to create. The big question is, always coming down to, no, I've never really heard an argument for why Britain actually works better, but it's the politics of Britain work for this business. But there is a suggestion that politics of Scotland are no better, or that they haven't improved, and therefore there's not a democratic um, political system that will deliver this in Scotland. Well, I'm going to tell the story I must have told a hundred times, but it, it makes me want to cry every time I hear it. I was walking out of town hall in a working class area of South Edinburgh, and on my way out, a grandmother started to walk with me. She was just chatting, and she says, you know, I've never been involved in politics in my life, so never at all. But it, it's my grand wings. Incidentally, I've always noticed that troublemaking grannies always bring like grand wings. I think she was just a troublemaker, but she said it's former grand wings. Um, I can't set this aside. So I went out and I joined Jess Scott and I've been putting me through, through doors. And I thought, oh, good on you, that's great. She turned around to me and she said, the most important thing anyone said in this campaign so far, she said, see when this is over, I'm not going back to my sofa. That was the single most stimulating thing anyone has said to me in politics almost in my whole life. What I want to see here is, this is such, I, I, I mean I accept Jackie's points, there are failures in the white paper. I would point out that, why is it okay that Gordon Brown cut um, corporation tax by five pence? In, in his 10 years, and he did that by raiding the pensions fund. Why is that yeah. okay? Um, on one side, it's not the other. And the other thing is, let's say the SNP did cut in corporation tax to 17%. Um, that'd still be 17% higher than a corporation pays in London, where the corporation tax rate is zero because they don't pay corporation tax. So yes, I think there's failures in the politics on all sides. The question is, what chance is there in the system of Westminster politics? Who believes that politics is something that's done to you? Because Westminster does believe that. Um, who can imagine that in a politics that believes it's done to you that will ever create a decent democracy? And I'll be clear about this. Whatever happens after this, um, the 18th, me and virtually everybody I have known in this campaign, they are all saying the same thing. The politicians think it's going to go back like it was, and it's not. All of them are telling me this. You have no idea how many people I meet in town halls, whether it's activists or whether it's people in the panels, because most of these town hall meetings don't have politicians on them. It's largely activists who are in them. And they're all, and meeting after meeting, people come up and say, who is going to give us this? And I say the same thing to them every time. When are you going to take it? That is the big opportunity to create a Scotland which isn't based around a Westminster of feudal deference without a written constitution where the people are supposed to nod through powerful people once every so often. And if the Commons gets uppity, there's always the Lords to put them in their place. That's Westminster. That's the structure. In Scotland, we can begin again simply getting rid of that mindset and simply saying, hey, look, we're a small country with amazing resources. What do we do now? Simply doing that will change things, and it will change things fundamentally. Even if there's a no vote, Scotland can't go back. I'm sick to the back teeth of bunker politics. Bunker politics is bad politics. Here we go, something we prepared earlier. Sorry we didn't ask you. It's got to end. Nobody's going to end this in Westminster. Nobody's going to end this in the UK system. I want this because I am a you know, territorial democrat. That's what I would describe myself, a territorial democrat. I believe you draw a circle and you see here is a territory and those inside of us, we have a democratic view. And I do think there's a fundamental difference between the democratic territory which is Scotland and the democratic territory which is England. We vote differently and we do. Therefore, if we can have the chance to make that vote and start again in a system of our choosing, it's not what we are now that will end inequality. It's what that will allow us to become. Something that Westminster will not allow us to become. Thank you both so much. It's um, 20 to 8. We have until about 
fifteen for questions and answers and debate. Do we have microphones or are we just no, we're a small enough room, we can just we can just manage. Um, so I'd ask you to raise your hand if you'd like to make a point or ask a question. I'd also ask you to keep it brief so we can get as many um, voices from the room as we can. I'll think I'll probably take about three and then and then see where we get to. Gentleman at the front. It was a question, well it's not a question really. Uh, what do you have to talk about equality in Scotland? To get any degree of equality, we'll need to have funds. I'd like to ask Jackie if the Scottish people are contributing to London's Crossrail and high speed too. Okay. Okay. Can we have hands up again? I'm sorry, I should have said about, about three. I'll take person at the back of there and then the hand raised over here on the on my left. I'll stand up Thank you. I'll have to work this quite carefully. We've got 2.5 million children in the UK in poverty and that number is rising. And you can definitely, I'm sorry, I, I think you can firmly put the blame at the door of Ian Duncan, Ian Duncan, Ian Duncan Smith and his, and his policies, which as far as I'm concerned all I can see is, is increasing inequalities. I, I should explain I'm a nurse. I've had to study the HSM report, the black report, the blue in the face. To word this carefully, on the 19th of September, whether we spoke yes or whether we won't know, how are things going to change in Scotland to actually move away from his, frankly, appalling policies that are only increasing the divide? Thank you. And there was a hand up over here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hello. My name is uh, Pat Smith, and uh, I. I'm not a, 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 as you can see, I'm wearing my yes badge, so I've given the game away there. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not an SNP supporter and I'm not uh, a Labour supporter either. But I agree with a huge amount of what uh, Jackie Bailey said this evening. And I do take on board that for things that we agree on, we fight together. And we'll fight together whether there's a yes or a no vote. We'll do it now and we'll uh, do it there. But the thing I liked about uh, what Jackie was saying was that it wasn't, it's not a constitution that will change things. And that's what I always say on the doorstep. Not so much a constitution, I go a little further and say there is, it doesn't matter if you like the SNP or you don't like them, it's not the SNP or indeed any other government that has made change. What has made change is because when people stand up, Jackie talked about, uh, uh, about fighting for a vote, but everything we've ever won, the vote, the welfare state, everything else, everything that's ever been bad that we've fought against, we've defeated, that's how it's been, not because of governments. But then I was very disappointed when Jackie came back and we got back into party politics. The SNP will be in office after, uh, uh, after the referendum, but we get a chance to vote again very shortly after that, in 2016. So we shouldn't hang it on party politics, because if people have said, this is not, this is not what immediately <coughs> happens. This is our future, our children's future, for generations to come. And why people are not fighting back, and why aren't we doing it to a great extent? I think because people are hugely demoralised, because they have been fighting and they haven't made change. And generally, people like us, working class people, are vilified, we're blamed because we're not the high achievers, because, you know, so it's quite hard. Can you imagine if we got a yes vote? The reason I'm voting yes is that it's more democratic, because we would have here the government that we vote for. We don't, we're not voting for that shower at Westminster, you know, by and large. I know there are some Tory voters in Scotland, but there's not that many. So we would have the people that we vote for, so at least it would be democratic. But what I'm thinking is, it's not it would be some glorious utopia, socialist or otherwise, on the 19th of September, but imagine the boost that we would get. And I think that that would inspire us to stand up and fight back with something better. Thank you. Thank you for that contribution. Before that, I have a question. A question at the front about 
what contribution do um, Scottish taxpayers make? I guess not just to Crossrail and HS2, but to, to projects that only benefit um, people in England. And a question at the back about about child poverty in particular, whether or not there's any possibility for reducing children the rate of children in poverty as long as we've got Ian Duncan Smith in um, government. So do you want to both respond yeah. to I'm, I'm those? happy to do that. Yeah. Um, on, on money we of course contribute, as people do across the United Kingdom, to big infrastructure projects. Um, and that That's is well, something... There we go. Hold on, if, if you let me answer. Okay. Um, that is something that sometimes might not make sense because it takes place somewhere else, you know, and we can't see the immediate benefit of it. But there will be things that where we are net recipients um, rather than contributors that, that matter enormously. The one area I'm going to give you an example of is in renewables, because everybody recognises in Scotland the potential, the potential, I can finish, of, of wind and wave and yes, even today solar energy is just enormous. And we receive from the UK government grants to develop that potential that are in the region of about 36%, whereas our population share would be 8%. So that is a, an example of where the money flows the other way, um, and we benefit enormously because we're able to develop... The House of Lords just take the reverse power from us. Sorry. I'm trying to answer your question. I'm sorry if you're disappointed with the response, but I'm genuinely trying to provide you with an answer. In terms of child poverty, you know, I, I have never believed that you've required different powers and you had to blame somebody else for not having the power to actually do something about it. Um, when you look at the record that was achieved in the first parliament, 200,000 children lifted out of poverty, more than halved. We did so without necessarily control over a particular set of powers. We did so because we had a focus on it. And in Scotland, the number reduced by a greater extent than it did across the rest of the United Kingdom. So this isn't a debate about the constitutional war powers. This is a debate about political will. There are a number of things we would do. One billion pounds has been stripped away from anti-poverty budget. We would put that back in. We would have a focus on zero to threes. We published a social justice sounding board paper that sets out what we would do to tackle child poverty. And we can do it now, you know, and I will join with anybody of any political strike on that journey, but I'm not sure I would entirely convince Ian Duncan Smith to change his strike, um, you know, and I do think what he's doing to the welfare state is appalling. Can I just deal with the last one very quickly? You can. Okay. Um, the, the, there isn't a huge amount that I disagree with in, in, you know, your hope for the future and how you want to achieve it and how you want to go about it. The issue for me is I don't think you need to vote yes in order to do that, okay, but, but I look forward to seeing you on the 19th. Um, actually arguing from the same principled point of view. When you say you only ever get, you'll get the government you vote for, that's not true currently with the Scottish Parliament, because the majority party um, actually was elected on a popular vote of something like 35%. Um, so it's not the case that you will always get the government that you vote for. We live in a quirky democracy. That's what makes it so exciting. Um, and that's what delivers both independents and Greens and others into the Parliament that, that forms that rich tapestry. But, but I just wanted to pick you up on that last point. Thank you. Robin, I would just answer from here. Put them up, doing a feel bit Jack in the boxy. So if anybody needs me to stand up, give me a shout. Uh, I, um, let, me, let me answer those round about in the other direction here. I, I'm going to speak up in favour of constitutional change. This campaign we've been hearing over and over, constitutional change doesn't change anything. I will vote for women as constitutional change. That's a change of the constitution. I mean, it was a good thing. So it was, um, it's a change of the con it's constitutional change. It changed the constitutional right of people in that society to vote. Um, all the independence movements were constitutional change. And I think constitutional change can be a great thing. I think it can be a very liberating thing. Not necessarily, but it can be. And um, to, to shift from cats to dogs for a second, because cats are way too clever for this analogy. <laughs> um, if you want a dog to behave well, keep it close. Don't let it get away. That's the same thing with democracy as far as I'm concerned. I am a fundamental believer in smaller units of democracy because the further you let democracy get away from you, the worse it behaves. 
The closer democracy is to you, the more you can keep an eye on it, the more you can keep it honest. It is that simple. We know the correlations between small countries and higher degrees of inequality. It's not accidental because their parliaments are closer. I mean, their parliaments say, actually, we're just all going to award rich people adequate. Hold on a minute here. We can hear you. You're quite close to us. We know what you're up to. Now, this does not mean that democracy is, is flawless because to depict the, the, the high speed rail, one of the things that I try not to do is have a go at all those Westminster people feather in their own bed and blah blah blah. Because bluntly, um, Westminster thinks that Westminster priorities, anything that's in its front door is really important. So they really believe that the, the London Underground system is national infrastructure. They really believe that. Yeah. Um, but then Holyrood thinks that Edinburgh is the capital and therefore the investment goes to there. Yeah. And then I'm in South Lanarkshire and Hamilton thinks that it's actually South Lanarkshire and I'm 30 miles away and well, you know, bigger than... And believe, if you keep it bigger, the folk at the north of the town would probably think that their roads are even fixed and the folk at the south of the town probably think that it's their It is inevitable that power tends to pull towards itself. Now, the, the economic, some of the things that are being done by Westminster, I think are fairly egregious versions of this. Um, we don't need another, Scotland does not need another terminal at uh, Heathrow. We do not need the high speed rail that stops at Birmingham. This is not good for us. And you kind of want to say, brilliant, get yourself a devolved parliament, take that out of your budgets, and let's keep national. Pa but that's not going to be resolved within the UK. There's no way that we get around that. It won't be fully resolved within Scotland. But devolving budgets is the key. Let people manage their own budgets and answer for their own questions. And again, this is a bit more or less the same fundamental question. Yeah, which is, you get it close, keep an eye on it, and make it do what you want. Don't let it get it far away and be captured by powerful people who don't let you need it. And on the, on the um, child poverty thing, one thing that I will say absolutely in the credit of the SNP, or maybe not the Scottish Government, but it's, it's Working Group on Welfare, its report on welfare is excellent. Go and look at it. Go and have a look at the Scottish Government's Working Group on Welfare reform. If that was put in place rather than what we have, um, it would be transformational. And all I can say is the, that, that document is far too radical for Ed Miliband. This yeah. is the important thing to look at. It's, the paper in London is not going anywhere near the <coughs> of that. They're still playing UKIP games and Tory games down there. And the worst of it all is, I take no pleasure in this, but I don't look at Ed Miliband and think he's got any chance of being Prime Minister. And that's yeah, the real problem. It's, it's, right. not, it's okay. not there. I, don't, I think we're stuck with IDS for a, a good long time still. Yes. It's, we're going to take um, a few more questions. Can we make the next set of questions a little bit snappier and the next set of responses? A little bit snappier. So we can get more people involved in this. One, two, and three. Thanks. I'm going to do two really short questions, so I'm torn between which one is most important. One is about control over taxes. I don't really see how we can change anything about income inequality unless we have control over how much tax we pay. And I understand at the moment that with the system of investments that we have no control over that at all. I'm more confused correctly. The other thing is about food security and sustainability, and I'm interested to know from both of you what your sides think about land ownership in Scotland um, and how that could be changed and how all of us could get a bit of land to grow our own food yard or something more sort of community-wide that's important. Thank you. Jacqueline? Hi, uh, hey. I'm Stuart, I'm from the Radical, <coughs> the Radical Independence Campaign. Um, I think it's important to remember that uh, um, income inequality is only one type of inequality that's a problem. We also have asset inequality, whether you own a house, whether you have a pension, whether you have shares, things like that. And I think the problem with the devolution proposals that the parties backing a no vote um, are putting on the table is that it only gives the Scottish Parliament power to deal with income tax, and it doesn't give us powers to increase things like inheritance tax or introduce a land value tax. And just another point. I don't think it should come as any surprise that Tory, you know, inequality increases under Tory government, Tory governments, because Tory governments do what Tory governments do. But I don't doubt Jackie's sincerity. But the fact of the matter is that economic inequality increased under the last Labour government, and it was Peter Mandelson who said that he was seriously relaxed about people becoming filthy rich. So, you know, I agree with Robin that it's simply unrealistic to expect Ed Miliband to do anything about it. You talk about common meal and the Scottish government not quite seeing eye to eye and everything. Do you see a way where they can work together and make things better when we do get yes? Um, well, I'll start with that one and work yeah. with me backwards. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I play um, post 19th 
post September Scrabble all the time. What are the different or what are the different layouts that mm -hmm. you could end up with? Can you have a green as the coalition breaker? Can we make mm -hmm. SNP common wheel? Could Labour become yep. common wheel? Mm -hmm. Will there be a new party that will come through? And I mean, uh, this is the conversation that I, I'm involved with more than just about any other just now. And then Dennis sure, campaign, which is what happens afterwards. Um, I, I haven't got time to go into my, my analysis of this at the moment, okay. but let me put it like this. I am absolutely confident if there's a yes vote that there will be a major party with the chance of winning stands at the 2016 Scottish elections on a common real manifesto. And if it's not the SNP and if it's not mm. Labour, and if the Greens don't look like they're a series winning opportunity, something else will emerge. Mm. So the, I, I think it's inevitable there will be something there. Jumping up to tax, um, sure, I completely agree, and to come back to this question with the tax, I actually know, um, and again, this is all explained in detail in the Commonwealth book, which you get, <coughs> and it's got all the information in it, tax is not the solution. The problem that we've got at the moment is it's economic inequality, and this is why, even if you look at either set of the statistics about whether inequality grew or shrunk under the last Labour government, the fundamental underlying inequality did grow. Wages at the top kept increasing, wages at the bottom were very, very stagnant. In fact, was it, I'm trying to remember the number, for the majority of people didn't actually see a real term wage increase. It's a low wage economy that's a problem, not a low tax economy. And if you fix the wage structure, the taxes solve themselves. And this is why we can't tax our way out of it. 50% of the Scottish public are not net contributors to tax because they live in poverty or degrees mm. of poverty. The tax base has been so already, uh, um, eroded by our economy that you can't tax your way out of it. Which is why they say, we'll give you more income tax powers. Fine, there's nothing we can do with them. We can't use them because all we can keep doing is taxing 50% of the population more and more and more and hoping that was going to resolve things. We need to have economic transformation and the investment needs to come from proper borrowing. There's an entire food section and food security and land reform in the paper. And what I would argue is when we're talking about this rebalancing of the economy, creating a new economy, we've got to stop working on the basis of profit and we've got to start working on the basis of productivity. If you do that, land stops being a speculative entity, which is what it's currently used for in Scotland, and it becomes a productive entity. Food's only a small part of it. Um, Large-scale biomass, or large-scale new housing, or all sorts of land <coughs> things are possible. Some of this can be done with the Scottish Parliament, but I will keep saying land reform can be done just now, but the ability to invest to change that, we don't have borrowing powers. So we can all we can do all the land reform, and we can't do the fundamental changes until we have the capacity to borrow and invest. It, well, what's fascinating is, it, you know, whilst I always love Robin, that was just wrong because we actually do. Um, powers was transferred in the Scotland Act of 22, 2012, sorry, um, in terms of additional borrowing powers. That's clear. The Parliament's passed it. These are already powers that are coming to the Parliament the over coming. over. No, no, but it's been passed by the whole parliament. I have to say, at each stage, some of these powers and transfers of powers, and even the creation of the Scottish Parliament, has been resisted over time by you know, some extraordinary sets of people. But these powers are now guaranteed in legislation. We pass them virtually unanimously in the Scottish Parliament. So actually, you can. And I think that's where absolutely the imaginative work roundabout land reform can, can happen. Um, I was very proud of the land reform legislation the Parliament's passed. I'm very proud of you know, both governments um, you know, in looking at community buyouts and doing things like that. But there is much more we can do, and we have the borrowing powers to do so. So there's something that doesn't depend on changing your constitution. We could be doing it now. That's a matter for me of political will um, and what priority we ascribe to things. Secondly, in terms of, you know, is it tax or is it pay? It's actually both. You know, I'm quite happy to suggest that those top income earners in Scotland should contribute more, but I'm equally passionate about making sure that those who are the lowest paid don't need to require benefits in order to live um, you know, at a decent level of, of income. We argued in the Scottish Parliament for the introduction of the living wage. In government, we introduced the national minimum wage, we set up a low pay commission, we set up a high pay commission. You know, the inequality rose. I'm not going to kid you on about that, but it's not for the want of trying. Now, in the Scottish Parliament, we had an opportunity to introduce the living wage that would have transformed the experience for a lot of low-wage people, that would have overnight made a difference to inequality, and the government voted it down. We could have done that now. So for me, I get depressed about the missed opportunities. So it's not about waiting two years. We could change people's lives 
now. That's why I think simply changing the constitution isn't right. One last, last thing um, about taxes. All three of the parties advocating a no vote have actually pledged to guarantee more powers to the Scottish Parliament. Um, that includes power over taxation um, and over some elements of social security. They did that yesterday. Thankfully, they had sunshine to do that yesterday when they were out in Carlton. Thank you. Can we take some more questions? Hands up, please. Yes, go ahead. Well, You're thanks. the only person to put your hand up. Well, 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 everyone else is having up. Um, I, I have to say, I probably don't know enough about the detail in terms of what, what's devolved and what, what's, uh, what powers the Scottish Parliament does have or not. But I take Jackie's point that, that as of today, the Scottish Parliament does have more powers than it uses to probably to, to uh, deliver greater equality. Um, at least two of you, if not all of you, have said, look at the evidence, get your hands dirty in the data. Thanks, Kate. Nice, nice phrase. Um, does this evidence suggest that an independent Scotland would radically transform uh, um, the inequality gradient, if you like? Um, I take heart from Robin's suggestion that maybe new parties or a new party will emerge. Perhaps that's the only way to do it. But the current set of politicians don't seem to have done as much as they could have to, to, you know, to build a more equal Scotland. So why are they going to do it in an independent Scotland? Thank you for that question. I think it's, it's, it's such an important one. It's so central to the debate that's going on tonight that I'm actually going to stop there and ask you both to respond to that rather than taking any more at this point. Would an independent Scotland be a more equal Scotland? Let's just kick off with a thing that I can only ask you to never let leave your minds. The fourth most unequal in the developed world. How difficult would it be to be better? <laughs> this, is, this is a crucial thing. Um, it, it's, it's hard to see what we could do to make it worse. <laughs> I mean, it really is. What we, 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 there's only a couple of extreme examples where we could go down the road off, so we could abolish the NHS. That would probably make us less. Well, they do uh, I've been doing that down south, and that's working away in there. But, um, so there's not much that we could do that's worse. Um, what this has done, the fundamental thing this campaign has done, has, for my mind, is lifted our heads and our eyes up. And one of my favourite quotes uh, of all time is the Oliver Wendell Holmes, the civil rights activist, who says, a man's mind, once stretched by a new idea, never regains its original dimensions. <laughs> Scotland's mind is never going to go back again. Um, so the, the kind of stuff that Jackie says whereby, well, yes, we, we, you're not allowed powers on living wage. We don't have any powers on, on setting a living wage. Yeah. We, can, we can put a clause in the procurement bill, making it conditional on procurement pro con uh, Project, which means the only companies which are bidding for public contracts might have to do it, and they would certainly have us in court for many years because the, 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 it's European law. That's procure, European procure, procurement law. If we have the powers of a normal country, we could just do it and there's no legal challenge. So that's to give you an example. But um, and likewise, we've got two billion of borrowing powers. We've explained how a national investment bank capitalised with five billion. Um, would, would enable us to have an investment programme of 100 billion over 20 years. Again, it's all explained in the book. So these are things which you can definitely do. Now, I only keep coming back to this point. Um, how can you judge the future? I've been seeing, in fact, there was, one of the saddest things that happened in any of the public meetings I was at, there was a woman from Rwanda who came to the meeting. And she, she'd come over here and she fl fled the Civil War ten years ago and she came up to Scotland five years ago. She said she loved it here. She said that she said, I love the place, she never wants to leave now. And she says, I've got the white paper. And she says, I've read it all the way through twice and I still don't know the right answer. And I was so upset. I said, to her, my God, there's no right answers. This is the future. There's best guesses. All of us have a best guess. There's no, if you want certainty, buy a digital watch. <laughs> there is no certainty about the future. So, so looking only at this, <laughs> ask one simple question. 
Where is the democratic will to do this stronger, Scotland or the UK? Where is the parliamentary structure got a better track record of delivering this, Scotland or the UK? Which is the country with the worst track record in this, Scotland or the UK? Somebody explain to me how you could see the UK as the better bet in a future of uncertainties. Thank you. Um, I suppose for me, my, my starting point is I don't look at this based on borders or geography or nationalism. I look at this based on social justice and tackling inequality. Um, and that, that is the frame of reference for me. For are me, that, that is... Robin does? For me, sorry? But are you saying that Robin does? No, I'm talking about myself. I'm not prescribing a view to Robin. And in fact, I know Robin thinks very differently to the SNP. Um, you know, he and I have debated before. But the problem I've got is they are the party with the white paper. They are the party... Um, that electorally looks as if they'll succeed, which is, not which is why, which is why you should look at the white paper and critique that. Because Robin's kind of proposal is, you know, by voting for independence, you can have a new set of arrangements. You might have new political parties. You know, it, he offers, you know, a lot of kind of hope for the future, but it is not necessarily based on what I think might happen. Okay, yeah. and that that's the problem. It is based on, you know, changing. The, the way things are done, and, and, and I know he talks about politicians in a particular way, but, but that applies to SNP politicians as well. And what I want to do is say to people, you know, whatever way you vote, you need to look at what the proposal is that you're being offered. And you cannot, you cannot genuinely have a better welfare state if you have fewer taxes to pay for that better welfare state. The sums just don't add up. Yeah, but, but the frustration, if, if I can finish, as I look at what, what goes on currently, I look at some of the levers we have. The Scottish Welfare Fund, underspend. Discretionary housing payments to end the bedroom tax, underspend. A year fighting with the Scottish Government to actually mitigate the bedroom tax, because we could do that. Rubbish. I mean, I watch Strathclyde Region, it's not. I watch Strathclyde Region make payments to the miners when people say it's illegal to do so, because they had the gumption and the political will to do that. It took a year for us to get the government to do that. Now, genuinely, I think, I, want, I, I just think, if you have levers now, even if you have don't, you don't, you would use them because you see that child poverty isn't improving, it's stagnating, and it's starting to go the wrong way. There's so I fundamentally so much believe, already to mitigate that, though. I fundamentally believe that we have a responsibility now to do something about it. Um, you know, I'm a great believer in offering people hope. Absolutely so. But that's not what's in the white paper. That's it's not what, not what people yeah. say. Um, and I genuinely <laughs> think that we make a mistake if simply we think that constitutional change is the thing that will tackle greater inequality. What I'm thrilled about, even though people will disagree about my arguments about why you should vote no, is actually people care about this. And I do think Robin's right. There is a debate that's been energised, and I very much welcome that. It's how we harness that, whatever the result, come the 19th of September, that I believe is particularly important yeah. and should actually join us more than, than you know, the ultimate conclusion of the vote on the 18th of September. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, so we're coming to an end. I'm really sorry, those of you who have not had a chance to ask um, questions earlier, maybe you can nobble our um, debaters on as they try to leave the building. <laughs> <laughs> Strong arm on the staircase or, or something like that. What I've been struck by tonight is the common ground, actually, how everybody in this room, I think, seems to me to be committed to progressive politics and seems to me to be passionate about creating a better society in Scotland. So, you know, in, in a sense, you are all on the same page. And I feel a bit embarrassed to be sitting here chairing this as somebody from England with absolutely no right no to, to, to speak We're about these things happen. at all. I, I feel there's, there's a real tension. As an English person, I desperately want Scotland to stay in the Union because I think we might be sunk without you. Well. <laughs> if I was Scottish, I think <coughs> I'd probably be voting for independence and just a chance to try and do things differently. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think those tensions are huge. I don't know how you resolve them. 
I suspect you'll start resolving them on the 19th of September. We will. And that perhaps you'll start finding your common ground then um, and working together. You Certainly, all of your minds have been stretched open by this referendum, by this possibility for Scotland, by the debates that have been going on. Um, I think... The most moving thing I heard tonight was your description of the woman who said she, she couldn't go back to just sitting on the sofa and not, not, not participating mm. anymore. You said that made you cry and I actually had to do a little bit of hard work here to stop myself blubbing in front of you all. Um, it matters when people get involved in politics in this way. You're involving your young people with confidence that no other society is really, really managing to do. You're having open debates. You're meeting, and you're actually quite nice to each other. It's a mutual appreciation. In a way that doesn't happen with a Westminster-style Oxford mm. debating, you know, public school debating. You are actually you have a lot of common ground. Um, yeah, Westminster is all conflict. So we want, I, we I want consensus here, we want more yeah. consensus. Yeah. There's a lot of things that we feel we can do if you know, we're not told what to do all the time. We don't get <coughs> what we ask for on a regular basis. I want to wish you all luck for the 18th Thank you. and for the 19th. So whichever side you're on on the 18th, I wish you luck. And on the 19th, I wish you luck on, on, on coming together and I will be following your progress with exciting anticipation because I think you can create going to be a more revolution. equal society with better levels of well-being for everybody here in Scotland. Thank you all for coming tonight.